You know, the thing that I remember most about that period, and I was spiritually and I think intellectually disabled because <laughs> I was just so sad. Um, but the, you know, the epiphany I had that my life um, as a romantic being was over, I really had that realization um, on the road to Clovis one day. And then it was, I just started taking those, those routes, just places where I could be alone. I just needed to be alone. And I was kind of done talking except inside my head. Like, you know, any other person that has an affinity with nature inherently. You're gonna retreat into nature when you're bruised and battered. You know, I, of course I'd read uh, Gretel Ehrlich's The Solace of Open Spaces, which is her story about recovering from the loss of a partner. And I just saw the scablands as, for me, the solace of broken places. You know, places that had been ripped open by this natural catastrophe. And it so reflected how I was feeling as a human being at the time. And so, in a way, I could see the landscape as a partner for me in that healing experience. And I hope the book captures that process because that's what was uh, going on in my spirit and soul at the time. You know, I haven't gone to church for years. There was, I grew up Catholic and I just felt, <laughs> you know, I would have arguments with God and it was just like, really, I don't give a shit, you know. I'm not going to try to kill myself, but, you know, I'm done. I mean, I'm broken. If you got anything else you want to throw at me, do it. Um, but I can handle it, you know. If I don't, then I don't. But I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna look away from this. I'm not gonna bury myself in work. I'm not gonna bury myself in ridiculous relationships, or organizations, or tasks to put this aside and say it didn't happen, and go to therapy and learn how to get past it, you know. And it's just like uh, this is the truth about what happened to me. It's happening to me. I'm gonna live it. And if something wants to get in my way and do me harm, then that's life, that's life on earth. You know, when I would do investigative reporting, I'm highly scripted, I'm highly tenacious. There's a, there's a plan, it's A to B, I know, I know how to move through that terrain. I'm a good person because my mother raised me to be a good person, but you really don't wanna mess with me. If you wanna, if you wanna stop me from getting at the truth, um, you're going to meet a different person. That was not how I, this pro project developed. I mean, that hammering personality was not the personality I, I could employ because I just, it just felt like an exoskeleton I'd shed. I was just down with my most vulnerable part, taking it in and letting, letting the experience become the story. And that is, that is what happened. That, that's what Beautiful Wounds is a creation of, that, that process. major floods occurred within the last 20,000 years. And when they happened, they, they just sent inland tsunamis through these areas of the Palouse. So you can see in a lot of the photography, the actual rocks that were just clean off. And it was, as Brett's, uh, the geologist described, it was braided. So these channels formed. And these channels carved deeply into the, the basalt and carried it away. It's in a dry part of, of our region, but it also is where the wetlands are because it exhumed these areas for lakes. That's a story of the Scablands and it is a, a unique terrain on Earth. It's where the United States government went to test the first Mars rovers because it was the closest place to Mars that they could find on the planet. It's unique. I get the sense of deep time there, which is interesting because the basalt is 17 million years old that got uprooted, which is not very old geologically. But because it's um, without trees, because it's right in your face, it, it does give this, this sense of time. You get a, a look into something that's much older than, than you are, and much older than your memories of your family tree goes back. And so it's, it's poignant there. I'm really sensitive to my carbon footprint and really sensitive to getting the most out of those journeys. And, you know, I, I do honestly 
recently try to do as much as I can on a bicycle, you know, just throw my camera in my backpack and go. I, I would say I've hiked hundreds and biked hundreds of miles in between the thousands of miles uh, that were put on the car. Obviously, I don't, I can't bike to Grand Coulee, but when I go out, I always push myself as just a citizen of the planet to make the most I, of I can out of that light and out of myself. I mean, it's. I could look back at some of the, the work that I've done as a photographer and a lot of the best stuff comes from the last effort to get the shot, the last try to get in the right position to get the shot that I want. And you know, I'm in my 60s now, I've got rheumatoid arthritis, I'm often in a lot of pain at the end of the day and I'm really proud of myself that some of that best work comes from just having the, the resolve to get it and to get it right. I'm Tim Connor. I'm a, a Spokane-based writer, photographer, who's spent most of his years in journalism, but occasionally when moved under the right circumstances, uh, feels like he can write and photograph a nature book, like beautiful ones.